Disrupting Japan, Episode 52. Welcome to Disrupting Japan, straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening. For the past few episodes, I've been telling you about some big changes that are coming to Disrupting Japan, and that series of changes has begun. We have a new website, and starting this episode, we have proper sponsorship. Our advertisers are companies that I know well, and I think you probably should too. Most of all, this gives us the resources to make two more big changes, which will be coming soon. I can only tease you about it right now, but I think you'll like it when you hear it. But for now, let's get back to today's story. Long before the maker movement existed, Akihabara was a world famous destination for, well, makers, really. Twenty years ago, wandering the streets of Akihabara on any given weekend, you would find masses of tinkerers and hardware geeks and robotics nerds and audiophiles, all shopping at small specialty electronics and computer shops. And I do mean small. Many of these shops were the size of food stalls. The internet changed all that. Around the year 2000, All of the parts and advice and community started to become available online. There was no need to go all the way out to Akihabara, and the small specialty electronics and computer shops began closing their doors. Over the next 15 years, Akihabara transformed itself into the center of Japan's otaku culture, with manga stores and maid cafes becoming the dominant form of commerce. That's all fine, I suppose. But DMM Make is trying to take Akihabara back to its roots. They've opened one of the most amazing maker spaces in the world, and they're gathering a community of makers in the middle of the otaku stronghold. Although, I admit, there's a lot of overlap between those two groups. Hey, I want to tell you a bit more about this, but let me first introduce you to a company you really should know about. I want to tell you about Justa. Now, I've known these guys for years, and I've been recommending them long before they became a sponsor. Just as really the only recruiting site that gets bilingual startups. Whether you're looking for American engineers or Japanese sales staff or the other way around, Justa can help you out. Unlike recruiting companies, they're priced to be very startup friendly, and unlike job boards, they're an active part of the startup community here. And they're trusted by some of the best talent Japan has to offer. So drop by justa.io and see what they're about. Now, DMM seems an unlikely company to affect this change. They are Japan's largest online porn retailer, but they've been diversifying into several industries very successfully over the past decade. Mitsuo Hashiba, the general manager of DMM Make Akiba, Explains how DMM Make Akiba is changing the nature of IoT in Japan and how DMM managed to pivot from porn to rapid hardware prototyping. So let's get right to the interview. Cheers.、Oh, cheers. So I'm sitting here with Mitsuo Hashiba, the general manager of DMM Make Akiba. Thanks for sitting down with us. Thank you very much. DMM Make is perhaps the most amazing. Makerspace and Internet of Things creative lab that exists in Japan. But why don't you tell us a bit about what DMM Make is? DMM.Make Akiba is located in Akiba, Akihabara in Tokyo. DMM built this facility in Akiba because Akihabara is very famous for electrical parts shops. It's interesting because Akihabara used to be. Very famous yeah, for electronics yeah, and yeah, yeah. parts and makers. Yeah, yes. And then recently it's become more famous for otaku culture. Otaku, yeah. So, in a sense, DMM Make is kind of going back to the roots of Akihabara.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In Akihabara, still many electric parts shops exist. There's many people who like build something. And DMM.Make Akihabara's、uh, main target is IoT hardware startups. Startups. People can go to Akihabara City to buy electrical parts. Oh, I see. So it's just very convenient for convenient, the、uh, yeah, convenient. very convenient for the Internet of Things based startups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. 
DMM dot Akiba.、Um, we have、uh, two floors. One is base floor. Base floor is a share office. People can use space、mm-hmm. freely. And base floor also provides individual room for three people and six people. And the, the other floor with the, the workshop、yeah. is what I think most people are excited about.、Uh, yes, yes. Other floor is called studio. This floor is a、um, kind of share factory.、Mm-hmm. Then our main target is IoT hardware startup and studio's concept is、um, rapid prototyping. Just looking at it, it seems that DMM Make has gone almost crazy with The amount of equipment. So there's lots of maker spaces in there, but you've got a lot of top of the line 3D printers, CAD CAM software, you've got、uh, testing devices to help yeah, people yeah. get certified. Yeah. It's really an amazing facility. What is the model? Because I noticed that you have different levels of membership. Is the basic model a specialized office rental?、Yeah. Or is it、uh, an investment model? What does DMM make? s Basic business model. At first, user pay fee for every month. We have three plans studio only plan and base only plan and the plan which can use both f l o o r So it's a, it's a specialized shared office space. Yes, shared office. We also have a corporate plan.、Mm-hmm. I, I noticed Intel has an office yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in here. Yeah. We, we had some collaboration with Intel and other accelerators. Corporate brand users,、uh, companies like Intel or Sharp or many makers, and they want to、um, try their products in here. Try their products? Do you mean they, they want to use the testing equipment or they want to test market and get feedback on their products from startups and the、uh, community? Both. And for example,、uh, Intel has a device called Edison. They wanted to try Edison's possibility. So they had an acceleration program last year. It was a very good trial for the big companies, I think. So was it run like a, a hackathon or was it a longer term program? Longer term program.、Okay. Um, six months program. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the successes we've seen come out of DMM Make Akiba. What are some of the most interesting Internet of Things projects you've seen come out of this community? It's a many, it's difficult to <laughs> select <laughs> one. If you had to pick one or two. The startup called Ixi, they have a very interesting, they design、uh, bionic arms. Right. They're, they're making、um, artificial, yeah, artificial arms. Yeah, artificial arms. Yeah, bionic arms. The why, what they do is interesting for me because most of parts can be made by 3D printer.、Mm-hmm. And its 3D data is open sourced. And their product make bionic arms as a fashion. So it's, it's very stylish and yeah, different stylish, designs. Cool and... designs are very nice.、Okay. Since they've open sourced these designs, is there a lot of collaboration、yeah. around the world on yeah, this? Yeah,、now? yeah, yeah. They have, they have a community to worldwide. And so many people are making、um, their own bionic comps. That's fantastic. Yeah, really great. This project was open source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with both startups and venture capital all having a global mindset, Mm-hmm. Do you think you're going to see a lot more international collaboration like that? Yeah. Last month, other startup called NNF, No New Folk Studio, they released their new product called Olfe. Olfe is a、um, luminous shoes which is related with a、um, smartphone application. I saw that. So when, when dancers can sort of yeah, program yeah, yeah, yeah. their shoes to blink and react and change colors. Yeah. As they move. Yes, yes. This is a、um, kind of IoT. They will start a lot of collaboration with dancers or some musicians or inside and outside Japan. Because this service doesn't need a language so much. Right. Dance, by definition,、yeah. is universal. Yeah. Their application has a very good function. If very famous dancer put on a l f e and dance, Application record how colors changed or how moved. So, it dancers fun can also trace、uh, this famous dancer's action. So, the dancers fans can actually see 
not only like the dance moves and the mm -hmm. steps this person made, but the, the light show that was programmed mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. That's cool. So DMM Make has been, been focused on, as you mentioned, the creation of mm -hmm. these new, clever Internet mm -hmm. of Things devices. Mm -hmm. But you've opened up offices around the world. Um, mm -hmm. I've noticed that there are Make offices in the U.S., mm -hmm. in India, and yeah. in several countries. Mm -hmm. So are these your own efforts or are these collaboration with local accelerators? Ah, yeah, we want to have a connection with accelerators all over the world. Our facilities main target is uh, startups or makers company. So we need a more connection and partnership with accelerators, not only in Japan, but also outside Japan. Okay. Well, tell you what, let, let's step back a bit yeah. and talk about your history and about DMM and and how DM and Make came to exist. Okay. For our listeners overseas, DMM.com became very famous in Japan for selling porn videos, mm. for uh, online games. Yeah. But in the last 10 years, last 10 years, DMN has done an amazing rebranding. Mm. So they're now diversified not only into DMM Make, but uh, DMM Securities is one of the biggest... Uh, FX trading platforms. Mm -hmm. So it's a leader also, obviously, in IoT innovation, robotics, cloud sourcing, uh, solar panels. And what's astounding to me is that they're not just throwing money around. These, these projects are effective. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know, how did that happen internally? How is a company that was so successful on one thing able to change its culture mm -hmm. and enter completely different markets successfully. Yeah. The key is DMM's chairman, uh, Mr. Kameyama. He's also my boss. I asked the same question <laughs> to him. <laughs> he said, um, no policy is DMM's policy, he said. DMM's policy is no policy. No policy. Yeah, exactly. He said, if you, can, if, if you find a good market, just search and try. Chairman Kameyama, he loves business. So he's looking for um, many kind of business models. So anyone that, that brought him a, a good business model, yeah, yeah, yeah. he would allow them to, to execute. No, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But within a company as, as big, and DMM was a very big company at that point. How do you get staff to execute? How do you get resources to execute? Because inside any company, it's, it's a fight to get any resources at all. It's an um, oh, eternal problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. We also have a system called Kamechoku. Kamechoku is um, not employed by a uh, DMM, employed by Mr. Kameyama. So he hires them directly? Directly. He always taking a new thoughts people into DMM. So when you were setting up DMM Make, was the staff primarily DMM staff, or did you go out and recruit staff from outside the company? Both. Members collected from inside and outside DMM. 80% hired from outside. Okay. Outside DMM. So only 20% of it was was um, company staff. Com yeah. That's very unusual for a Japanese spin out. No, yeah, yeah, I think so. It, it usually works kind of the other way, where 80% mm -hmm. are the mm -hmm. parent company yeah, staff yeah, yeah. and 20% are specialists. Because DMM is a company of internet service, but this Akiba is a hardware, it's very different. So, Mr. Ogasawa, he's a founder of and producer of DMA.MegaKiba. He started to hire many engineers from everywhere in Japan. I think culture is different from hmm. DMM.com. DMM.com is internet service, so work style is completely different. Well, that makes sense. If 80% are new hires and you're in a very different location, it makes sense you'd naturally develop your, your own corporate culture. Has DMM.com ever had a spin out that didn't work and they'd had to close down? Yeah, we tried to launch a lot of services. Not only successful services, but some services are not good. And the decision was made to shut those down pretty yeah, yeah, quickly? Yeah, quickly. That's, I've got to say, this is unusual for a Japanese company. The fail fast, fail forward. Mm. I work with a number of large Japanese companies who are trying to do open innovation and who are trying to do spin-outs. Mm -hmm. And most of them aren't doing it very well. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice do you have for big companies who 
want to spin out innovative subsidiaries? I think I'm, I have no authority to say that. But DMM is a 100% owned company. And we also have、um, strong digital services. So we can try new enterprise or service quickly. And、um, Mr. Kamehameha's mind makes it quickly. So he makes his mind up quickly. Yeah. So, so you think the secret really is just that it's, it's still a private company、yeah. that's controlled by one person、yeah. who can make a decision quickly? Yeah. Okay. That's good for DMM. That's hard to transfer to other companies yeah, who are yeah, trying yeah. to do it. But that does make sense. I talk with other facilities or owner or manager. Japan is a difficult country to start up,、mm. I think. So, Getting better. Yeah, a little by little, but not enough,、mm. I think.、Um, the problem is、um, number of VCs for, especially on hardware. Software, there are many VCs,、um, investors in Japan.、Yeah. But if Japan, Japanese government、uh, will support to a big company's entrepreneurship, it makes、uh, makers' culture better, I think. That's interesting, because I think one of the best things the Japanese government did for startups was just talking about them.、Mm. To have Prime Minister Abe say startups are important for the、mm. future of Japan, suddenly、mm. everyone's working、mm. with them and it's happening. So, what do you think government could do to help t h i s e n t r e p r e n e u r s or help open innovation、mm. in Japanese companies? What should they do? Very simple method is just m- money. Just funding? Funding, yeah. But otherwise,、um, the Japanese government should support buyer or companies who will introduce or buy. IoT startups product. Okay, so you think they could do a lot to, to do it from the demand side? Yeah. That'd because, be because if government helps startups, suddenly helps startups, but it、uh, may confuse about、um, price or、I、in the、see. market. Yeah, yeah, when there's a lot of money flowing in,、yeah. the prices go up, the, go up. So valuations get high.、Yeah. I thought、um, entrepreneurial system in the big companies and governmental support to a middle or small maker's company to introduce IoT. Huh. So looking into the future, with all the changes of the Internet of Things and all the crazy changes going on in DMM Make, what is DMM Make going to look like in the next 10 years? But the basic style will not change in the future. What do you mean? Our value is a、um, new startup comes up and they release their service into the world. DMM and MegaKiba wants this cycle、uh, increasing. So you're, you're going to keep the same model? Yeah, same model. Just, we are just a platform for people who want to make something. Our mission is a more strong platform. So, in 10 years from now, it'll be the same business model, just bigger and more companies. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I mentioned before that the Internet of Things today is a lot like programming was in the early 80s. Yeah. Where a lot of people are, are kind of playing with things and、mm. coming up with cool ideas, but finding it really hard to make money on it.、Mm. In Japan, what do you think needs to change for? IoT companies to really take off and be successful? Just my mind will be changed, I think. How so? Like, whose mind? What, what kind of thinking will change? Technology is just one of the solutions.、Mm. But now that I went to many contests or hackathons, some products are very good, very nice,、uh, innovative. But other than just technical started service, and sometimes I, I ask to their builders, why don't you use a smartphone? Many people couldn't answer. So, technical is very important, but from the first industrial revolution program, it's fast than some.、Uh, you think the makers need to focus more on real world problems, problems and maybe、uh, think about business a little more? No, I, I think so. That makes sense. Especially in the、like, city area like Tokyo or Osaka or urban area, very convenient to live.、Mm-hmm. But I think there's more, many problems outside the city. I think so too. What happens a lot, I think, for all kinds of startups,、yeah. founders like to solve the problem that's in front of them. They、mm-hmm. want to solve the problem they see.、Mm-hmm. And since we're in Tokyo and so many founders are in、mm. Tokyo, it's, everyone's trying to solve Tokyo's problems.、Mm. I think many, many very small problems are not in Tokyo or、well, somewhere else. So we're talking with a、um, governor from out everywhere in Japan and outside Japan. 
Then I ask them, is there a problem in your prefecture or your, your area? So they have a lot of problems. But it is interesting because the, the founders themselves and the money and everything really is in, well, not just in Tokyo, but in the big cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be good if there's some way to communicate that mm-hmm. information or, or have the creative founders understand mm-hmm. the problems facing rural yeah. areas. Yeah, so we want to correct the problem from everywhere inside and outside Japan. Then we will see if this problem can be solved by IoT or not. Now, with the offices you have all over the world, have you noticed a difference between Japanese hardware startups and hardware startups outside Japan? I think no big difference between inside Everyone's and outside kind of Japan. Same. I'm finding that too. Just in the last five years, the gap between Japanese startup founders and foreign startup founders has become very, very small. Mm-hmm. The gap between Japanese VCs and foreign VCs is still pretty big. Okay, so if the makers and founders in Japan are pretty much the same as the makers and founders everywhere, but certainly the, the products they're making are different. Mm-hmm. And uh, last year, you took a delegation of 10 Japanese makers to South by Southwest. Mm-hmm. And what was the reaction there to the Japanese Internet of Things things? They promoted successfully, connected with um, many people from all over the world. So are there any industries or any sectors or any applications where you think that Japanese IoT companies are particularly strong? Security and agriculture. Agriculture? And uh, Meditech. Meditech, okay. Why agriculture in particular? Because Japan has um, four seasons very clear. Mm -hmm. And we also have... um, many agricultural area in Japan. Right. Of course, I know um, foreign countries has a lot too. Japan is not big land, so quality of sand or environment is very important, I think. Here, we have some startups who are making um, agricultural device, mm. and I talk to them a lot. Well, you see, other thing that Japan has a lot of specialty agriculture, mm. where they're producing very expensive specialty fruits or vegetables. The farmers might be much more willing to experiment with new innovations on the the high end, the more expensive end. Okay. And for med tech, what do you see as Japan's big advantage there? Japan has a knowledge, but also there's many regulations for the medical approach Mm -hmm. in Japan. Strong knowledge and experience, but also those rules become small. Okay, so so the rules make it difficult to difficult introduce to new products. But that sounds like it would be a disadvantage. Uh, uh, this, uh, <laughs> so you think that'll that'll change? Do you mm-hmm. think they're going to? Do you think the government will change the regulations mm-hmm. to make it easier for startups? Yeah, if uh, government try to change their system. Well, I mean, the government has been. Very supportive of startups here, so hopefully they will make some changes. Yeah, but economic um, ministry is very look their eyes on to IOTs, but medical scene is a that's true. It's a different different ministry. different ministry, right? Maybe they'll change their mind eventually. Before we wrap up, let me ask you what I call my magic wand question. Magic wand. Question. Magic wand. So if I gave you a magic wand mm-hmm. and I said that you could change one thing about Japan. Anything at all. You could change uh. education or the markets or the government to make things better for startups. What would you change? Government. The government? What would you change? I know their staff are very busy, but I want them to um, discuss with more many people. Uh, so they take more outside advice? Yeah, because they did a very wide category areas. Just the correcting and data. And data and the real is um, not equal, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. They'll do market surveys, they'll collect information, mm, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily give them the accurate picture mm. of what's really happening. Mm. You would say it would be very worthwhile if the government would interact directly, more mm. directly with, with uh, small companies s- and individuals. Small, yeah. That would be a big change and a good one. Well, listen, before we finish, is there anything else that you want to talk about? I think Akiba is also a kind of startup. Yeah. Very nice platform to the, not only startups, but also some makers and foreigners. Our strong point is rapid prototyping. Please come and look 
uh, we have a also guide tour. Yeah, the guide tour. It's impressive. Who is busy? Us is busy. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, listen. Thank you so much for sitting thank down you so with me today. Thank you so much. So, do you want to sell into the Japanese market? Maybe sell your offerings to large Japanese companies? Do you want to do it for free? Well, let me tell you about Crew with two Ws. Crew runs open innovation programs for companies like Toyota and Panasonic and dozens of others who are just now starting to work with startups. It's a big change for these companies, but many of them are open to working with global startups as well. These programs are one of the best ways to jumpstart your business here in Japan. And they're absolutely free. Now I've known and worked with the crew team, and they're probably doing more than anyone to bridge the gap between corporate Japan and global startups. So drop by crew with two W's dot m e slash startups, and let's get started. And we're back. If you're a maker and you find yourself in Akihabara, I do recommend you drop in and take their free tour. It's a very impressive facility. DMM might be the only porn company who's managed to successfully diversify into other business areas. Clearly, the secret to how they have managed and continue to manage this is not only that DMM is a private and closely held company, but it's led by an open-minded CEO willing to listen to new business plans and provide new projects with both the backing and the independence they need to grow. Unfortunately. It's a recipe that most large companies will not be able to follow. Mitsuo and I are both bullish on Internet of Things startups in Japan, and for much of the same reasons. There are many areas where Japanese IoT startups have a unique approach and a unique advantage, and I think we are going to see even more interesting hardware startups coming out of DMM Make and out of Japan in general. If you've ever had problems prototyping or even using an IoT device, Mitsu and I would love to hear from you. So come by disruptingjapan.com/show052 and let's talk about it. When you drop by, you'll see all the links and sites that Mitsu and I talked about, and much, much more in the resources section of the post. And I also want to let you know that our second anniversary live show. Is coming up on September 13th at Super Deluxe in Rapongi. If you're on the mailing list, you'll be getting updates and information. If you're not on the mailing list, wait. Why aren't you on the mailing list? You can sign up on the site, or you can just get the event info there or on our Facebook page. Please let people know and help us get the word out. If you like what we're doing, share it with your friends. If you hate what we're doing, Then share it with your enemies, and most of all, thanks for listening, and thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.